Well, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday edition of Thursday Church. For those of you joining us online, we are always glad you are with us. Whether you are physically in this space at 7, I started to say 7-Eleven, that's Gracie's. 218 Main Street, whether you're physically here or you're watching us in real time or sometime next week, because we know a lot of you do that, we're just glad that you are with us and um, that you've just made the effort to be in God's house with God's people. And um, I'm thankful that through the technology that we have today that we can be reaching people all over the place, and that's an amazing thing. So we're getting ready to start this new series titled Jesus and Friends, and I realize there might be some, probably not in this room, but some that might criticize saying that we're taking too casual an approach to the Savior of the world, that uh, he is our Redeemer, and how, how, how could we call him a, a friend? And yet, if we look at the life of Jesus... And if we, we, we study scripture and we read our Bible, what we see is that Jesus did have friends, not just followers, not just people who, who were wanting to hear what he had to say or see what he was wanting to do, but people who were truly interacting with him in the manner that a friend interacts with one another, the way friends interact. And, and he connected with, with folks on a personal level and offered them true friendship. And so, yes, while he is our Savior, yes, he is our Redeemer, yes, he is God in the flesh, he desires that we accept his friendship also and that we are, we are walking with him every single day, just as a friend would. So um, when we look at Jesus, what we see is that... Um, the, the, the folks that he rubbed shoulders with and would have called friends, not just followers, there was a difference. Um, these friends, uh, they, they shared every aspect of, of all kinds of life experiences, similar to what we are doing here at Thursday Church. We, we share all kinds of aspects of, of shared life. And that's what, that's what Jesus did. They, they shared joy. They shared grief and sorrow. They shared a disappointment, but they also shared great pleasure. They shared wins. They shared losses. Uh, they, they shared life. And that's what a true friend does. A true friend walks alongside of you when things are good, but also when things are bad. The, the, the sign of true friendship is this, this, this longevity of, of sharing Every aspect of life, whether it is easy or whether it is difficult, shared life. And when, when you fall, a, a friend is the one who is there to lift you up. If you fall and somebody pushes you down, that's not a friend. Or if you fall and they turn their back on you, that's not a friend. And we know that from Scripture in Ecclesiastes 4, uh, 9 through 12, it says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked. And defeated. But two standing back to back can conquer. And three, three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. In other words, this a friendship thing, you can't have too many of them. They are needed, and the more we have, the stronger we are. So right off the bat, though, I do want to say, through this series, we are not going to glamorize friendship, because that's not, that's, that's, that's not what this is about. Um, we're going to be very realistic that have, having lifelong friends means you have to work at it. It means that there is effort 
involved in maintaining friendships. If you think back and you think, well, I used to be friends with so-and-so, or I used to be friends with this person or that person, but our lives just kind of fell apart. We just faded away from one another. It's because true friendship is work. To maintain true friendships, you got to put in the effort. And in full transparency, if what you are finding in your friendships is that they are very shallow and that um, the folks that you're spending time with don't want to have depth in the relationship um, or worse yet, they are artificial or fake with you, those are marginal relationships and we don't need any more of those. What we need is to be investing in true friendships, friendships that stick no matter the situation. A true friend will not abandon you simply because you disagree. There are people in this room that can testify to the fact that we've had disagreements and yet we are still lifelong friends. And the reason being is because friendship takes effort, it takes work. And it is worth it, my friends, because you grow even through disagreements. True friends... Um, also offer us all kinds of benefits and rewards. And there are, are, are studies out there on this very topic. I just read one that, that just took place with Pew Research Center. And they said that 61% of the, in, here in the United States, 61% of adults say that having close friends is extremely to very important. 61%. That's a pretty big number. But, but the, the, the statement wasn't just um, to have uh, extremely, that, that it's extremely to very important, but it goes on to say the rest of that sentence was for you to have a fulfilling life. So, so what they're saying is, is here in the United States, we believe that to have a fulfilling life, we do need friends. And the next part of the study was the part that I found uh, very interesting. This very same group of people was asked about uh, uh, some other questions about having a fulfilling life. And uh, only, let's see, only 23% of the group said that having a marriage was extremely to very important to have a fulfilling life. 26% said having children was extremely to very important. And and then the 24% said um, having a lot of money was extremely to very important to have a fulfilling life. If you think about that, and and, and in reading that research, nothing topped the 61%. Everything came in in the 20% range between like 18 to, to 27-ish, but 61%. So the bulk of people are saying to have an, a fulfilling life, uh, pursuing th- true friendship, not just these shallow friendships, but true friendship is extremely important. But then it just continued to get more interesting. Because here was the fact that I absolutely thought was amazing. The the data says that um, as we get older, we get better at understanding how to be a true friend. So with age does come some wisdom. I'm not 65 yet, but the, it said folks who are 65, I just want you to know that. So, um, but it said folks who are 65 or older, they have far more true friends than people who are 30 years and younger. And the older people, as it turns out, are more satisfied in their friendships because the friendships they are maintaining are true friendships. They've learned how to do this thing called friendship. So if you're struggling and you're in that 30 and under group and you're struggling to figure out what it looks like to be a friend to someone, talk to someone who's 65 or older because apparently they figured out how to do it. But friendship offers us even more than, than, than that. There are, there are other studies, one that was done by the Journal of Developmental Psychology, and uh, it speaks of health benefits, 
physical health benefits in our bodies if we maintain true friendships. I found that very interesting because if you have true friends and you spend time with them, it decreases the stress hormone in your body called cortisol. Go figure. So this, the, the health benefits are emotional. Our emotional health, if we have true friends, is stronger. Our mental health is stronger. So it's not just physical, it's emotional, it's mental, but it's also spiritual. Do you know that our spiritual health is better if we have friends walking alongside us, true friends, in the realm of learning about Jesus? So one of the things that I found interesting about the physical aspects of true friends is that when you're with a true friend, your blood pressure lowers. So if you're struggling with with high blood pressure, go sit with a friend because apparently it lowers our blood pressure. That's a pretty cool thing. That's a pretty cool thing. Having true friends, and this one I can't figure out. The lower blood pressure I get, but the next aspect, the next benefit, I cannot figure it out. But the statistics still lie, right? So here we go. Your immune system is stronger if you have true friends. Don't know how it works, but that's what the data shows. That, that our immune system, so we don't get as sick if we're spending time with true friends. I guess unless your true friends are sick and then you're going to get sick. But, but so you were supposed to laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so... Um, As we are talking about this issue of true friends, this week we are uh, um, putting it under the auspice of an unshakable love. Because when we look at Jesus offering us friendship, that's what he's giving to us. This unshakable love. That's what he modeled. It was perfect. It was profound. Um, and, And it was welcomed. And it still should be today. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't just offer this unshakable love, this true friendship to people who were going to return the the same kind of love and friendship to him. He offers this true friendship to absolutely everyone, even those who will reject him. That, to me, is amazing, and it also teaches us how to be a friend friend here on on this this side of heaven. As, As we are walking in this sinful world, are we truly offering friendship even to those that everyone else wants to reject? Because along the way, when we do that, there will be people who will meet Jesus because we offered them friendship. But think... Oh, woe is us if we will only offer friendship to those who will offer it to us in return. Because that's not what Jesus did. So open a Bible and we're going to look at uh, John chapter 12. That's page 894 if you're using one of our Bibles. If you're online, just use your table of contents and you'll be able to find um, uh, the book of John very easily. So this passage is going to highlight two distinctly different kinds of friends. One friend that was very true to Jesus. One friend, a friendship, it's, it's beautiful, it's pure, it's holy. It, it is, it, it's what we should be desiring in our friendship with Jesus. And the other friendship is false, it is shallow, um, it is, it is, it is not, it's not true, it's, it's fake. And so we see both of these, and yet... As we look at how Jesus offers friendship, he offers offers the same depth, the same beauty, the same purity of relationship to both. The one who receives it as well as the one who rejects it. Before we jump into this passage, there are a few things that I want to um, just touch on so we're all on the same page so we know what we're talking about here. It's going to use, use the, the village of Bethany, and it's going to speak of Bethany. And Bethany is about um, two miles 
um, from Jerusalem. And so what that meant was whenever Jesus had business in Jerusalem, so if he's going there to do ministry or whatever purpose he has in Jerusalem, because it's only two miles to Bethany, and that's the home of his very dear friends, um, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, that meant that he would stop over in Bethany because it was just so close, uh, like a 30-minute walk. And um, so he would stop in there for a meal with his friends, but often he would, he would walk back to Bethany to spend the night there. He would stay there because that was where he felt loved. That's where he felt comfortable. That's where he experienced true friendship. And so if he was in Jerusalem, you can pretty well count on the fact that if he needs to spend the night, he's staying there with his true friends. Or if he's not, he's at least stopping by to visit or to share a meal. We're also going to be told that this is six days before Passover. That's a very important piece of information because as Jesus has been speaking to his disciples, one of the things that he's been doing is preparing them for the fact that, that he is going to be leaving this earth. And now we are six days before the Passover. So he's crucified. Passover starts on uh, uh, Friday night to uh, Saturday night. So uh, he's crucified on Friday. So this is, this is the week that is called Passion Week. Um, and, and so they, the, the, John wants us to, to know the timing because uh, this true friend Mary, because of the way she responds. So her response has more power by us knowing that this is right before his crucifixion. So here we go, verse 1. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man that he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. So I looked on my perfume bottle uh, this morning just as a reference, and, and my perfume bottle is about this big, like that, and it's 3.5 ounces. So this, this is a, 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 a nice size jar. Uh, uh, Mary took the 12 ounce uh, jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. Nard is, is not um, uh, an oil that is common there in the Middle East. It came from either uh, the mountains of Nepal or India. So it was imported, but it was a necessary and an important oil used. Um, this is way before there was like embalming processes. And so this was uh, uh, used in burial. And um, it comes from the Nada Sakis uh, plant and they take the root of that plant um, from India or Nepal and they, they turn it into to an oil and then it is imported all over the world and it's extremely, extremely expensive. And one of the reasons it's, it's, it's so expensive um, is because of its potency, its power. Um, it, it has um, extremely aromatic and it is very long lasting. Nard was normally used in very small quantities, even when they were preparing a dead body for burial, because um, it only takes a few drops to do the upper part of someone's body and a few drops for the lower part of their body, and, and um, it, it had such a lasting effect. It, it would last for a very, very, very long time, which was important. In, in those days when we didn't embalm bodies. So this, this, um, this oil was not just used for burial purposes, though, because it was very fragrant, and it, was, it had a, has a beautiful aroma. But so there were other people who used this not for burial purposes, but the very, very wealthy, like, say, the, 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 the queen, um, or uh, a Pharaoh's um, wife, um, women who would have been in the king's harem 
So this is how it works. Not everyone who's in the harem becomes a wife and not all the wives become the queen. There is one queen, many wives, and that's so the king could, you know, do what the king wants to do, you know. And you don't do that unless they're your wives. So there's one queen, several wives, and then the harem, which you pick from the harem to be a wife. And from the wives becomes one queen. So the harem, in the harem, they would have used this perfume, but just a few drops, if you thought you were going to be called by the king. So um, perfume for the very wealthy, but you only used a few drops because it was so potent, or um, the more common use for, for everyday people was for the purpose of burial. So verse 3, Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping, wiping her hair, using her hair to wipe his feet. The house was filled with the fragrance, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray Jesus, said this, that perfume is worth a year's wages. Judas Iscariot is indignant. He is indignant as he watches what is taking place as this aroma is filling the space of, of the room as Mary pours out not just a few drops, but all of this perfume. And um, depending on what scholar you read, what theologian you read, um, the value of, of this nard is anywhere from $40,000, and that's the low end, that's the very low end, to 70000 or more. It depends on, on what the, uh, the, the minimum wage or the average wage would have been for this particular household. And so that is, has always been debated. Nobody really knows what their minimum wage was to get the exact uh, number today. But so it doesn't really matter to me. And it, it really doesn't because $40,000, even if that's the low end, if, that, if, that, if that's the, the, the minimal, $40,000, my friends, is still a boatload of money. I mean, $70,000, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of money. But in, in, it, it's just as much as, uh, for me, $40,000, to pour $40,000 out on someone's feet. $40,000. Up to seventy. dollars Who knows? But... That's what's taking place here. Verse 5, the perfume was worth a year's wages. This is Judas speaking, and he's indignant. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. And Jesus replied, leave her alone. This is where it gets really important, my friends. Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. He's a 33-year-old healthy man. And Jesus is saying, she's preparing me for my burial. Now, this, the essence of nard is going to last maybe a week, week and a half. That's a long time. I wish my perfume would, would, would last that long. But She's preparing me for my burial. Here are the disciples. They hadn't caught it. They hadn't caught that it was Jesus' time, even though he had shared that, that he was going to have to die, even though he had made it clear he was leaving. They, they, they hadn't caught it. But this, this one true friend, so insightful, she'd been listening. She had been listening even though women were not supposed to be taught, this woman, she was listening, she was learning, and she recognized what Jesus was saying when he's telling his disciples, my time is drawing near, and she prepares him for burial. Verse 7, and Jesus replied, leave her alone. She is doing this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have 
me. So in this passage, two very distinctively different types of friendship. Mary of Bethany, Judas Iscariot, both of them would have claimed to be a follower of Jesus. Both of them would have claimed to have friendship with Jesus. Both of them spent time with Jesus, albeit Judas Iscariot probably spent more time with Jesus than Mary. But um, So while they would have identified themselves as a friend, they really weren't both true friends. One was uh, an imposter. One was a liar. One pretended or feigned friendship. Uh, but it wasn't true. But Mary's friendship, it was true. It was pure. And so this week, as you use your study notes, what I want you focusing on is this unshakable love that Jesus offers, not just to Mary, but also to Judas. Both of them, even though, even though they don't respond in the same manner, they are both offered the opportunity. Are you offering people the opportunity to have true friendship with you? Or are you just choosing to be friends with people who are going to be friends with you in return? So he offers Mary, um, and Mary would have been the kind of person that we would have liked to be around. She, um, not only was she insightful, but she was just kind. She was compassionate. She had a generous spirit about her. We would have enjoyed spending time with her. Judas, on the other hand, we wouldn't have trusted him. We wouldn't have really wanted to spend time with him. Um, But two very different, yet they're both offered the exact same kind of friendship. And that doesn't even really make sense, does it? That's hard to do. It's hard to offer friendship to someone that you know is going to reject you. But that's what he does. And Jesus, um, in, in Mary's eyes, what, what we see in this friendship is that she values Jesus far beyond material wealth. That's an important thing. That's an important aspect. Are we putting material wealth before our relationship with Jesus? Because in this world, this messed up world, it's an easy thing to do. It's an easy thing to chase after financial gain before having true friendship with Jesus. Because that's what our world tells us to do, is to chase the almighty dollar. But she pours out a year's wages on Jesus' feet This oil could have been used or would have been used. The reason, we're not sure how she acquired so much. 12 ounces is a lot. Because a lot of households would have had um, tiny little vials for burial of their family. But she had 12 ounces. So we don't know if it had been a gift to her. We don't know how she acquired it. It is a very unique um, amount of nard, but she had it. It would have been enough to bury not just her family, her cousins and her loved ones and aunts and uncles. It would have been enough to bury the entire village of Bethany. Maybe that's what it was for. Maybe she was in charge, their family was in charge of it. I don't know. But um, what we know is she took it all and she pours it out on his feet. And this week, I have thought about this a lot. I, I've, I've thought about that, that moment. Of, of taking her hair. For years, I wore long hair, and I'm too old now, so I had to chop it. But um, to take her hair and, and to wipe his feet. And so what I've been thinking about is that the, she would have smelled like Jesus. When, when he walked into Jerusalem, the aroma of that oil, it's so powerful, it would have been upon him, but yet it would have also been upon Mary. And it made me think, am I spending enough time with Jesus that people can sense and know his aroma is upon me? I I think it's an interesting thought. I want, I want that. It's a good question to ponder. Are we spending enough time with Jesus that that his aroma has rubbed off on us? 
that we can just walk into a room and someone can say, I can, I can sense you've been with Jesus. That's awesome. But Mary's love for Jesus was her choice. She wasn't forced into a relationship with Jesus, and neither was Judas. They both had the same opportunity. They were both offered the same kind of true friendship, but they both had a choice to make. And so, while Judas was selected to be one of the 12, Jesus wasn't surprised by the fact that he rejects him. He knew that would happen. And just because he knew, a lot of people have said, well, well, well God made this happen so that, that Jesus, Jesus could be the redeemer of the world. Just because the Lord knows how you're going to respond, it doesn't mean that he forces you to do that. He is, um, he is all-knowing. So he knows how you're going to respond to something that's going to happen next week. But that doesn't mean that he will make you respond that way. That's what free will is all about. And we've all been given the beautiful gift of, of choice. And so I imagine Judas was selected because the Lord knew how he was going to respond. But yet he loved him. And offered him every opportunity. That's real important because no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter who you've hurt, no matter the mistakes that you have made, I want you to hear Jesus is still offering you the opportunity to choose him. He's not going to reject you even if you reject him. That's a powerful, powerful thought. So he had this opportunity, even though Jesus knew he was a thief, Jesus knew he was a liar, Jesus knew that the devil owned his soul. See, we don't have that same kind of in insight. We, we don't know that, that someone is going to be destined for hell. We are not God, but we are called to offer the same kind of love to everyone so that they have the choice to meet Jesus. I want you to hear that. Because sometimes we get criticized for welcoming everyone. We don't know how someone's going to respond, my friends. And we better be doing our part to offer true friendship, the kind of friendship that Jesus offered to this world so that they have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. John, um, when, when, when we, t t so that we know that Jesus knew who Judas was. John uh, 6, verse 70 says, um, And then Jesus said, I chose the 12 of you, but one of you is the devil. Can't get any clearer than that. I chose the 12 of you, one of you is the devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the 12 who would later betray him. And here's the thing. The, the example of this, um, this opulence with the 12 ounces of nard for Judas is the exact opposite. He betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, the... Uh, this, the, the, uh, the, silver, the, the value of silver has changed significantly since the first uh, century. But uh, what we do know is that it was very common. There were two very common silver coins um, that, that were rotating uh, through their economy. One was a shekel and one was a Roman denarii. And so we'll take the higher value. We'll look at the, the silver shekel. It would have weighed about 14 grams. One shekel would have been about 14 grams. So there were 30 of them. So you take 30 times 40. That means that, it, that this would have yielded um, 420 grams of silver. And last week, silver was um, 67 cents a gram. So if you take 67, no, it wasn't. It was 76 cents. So if you take 76 cents a gram toward uh, times the 420 grams, then we know in our money, 
in terms of, of today's world, how much these 30 coins would have been worth. And Judas Iscariot, he sells Jesus out for $319.20. Okay. Even on the low end, 40000 which I think it probably was higher than that, for 319 bucks. The difference. It... It's very apparent. So Judas realizes that what he's done is wrong. And so he takes the 30 coins back to the priest and and tries to return them. He tries to undo what he's done. But this is real important. Because we do this when we make a mistake, don't we? We try to undo what we've done. But he doesn't go to the Lord. He doesn't say, Lord God, I've made a massive mistake. I I am sorry. See, that's the first thing you do. When we make a mistake, the verbiage I use at my house is, you mess up, you fess up. You, You say, Lord God, I am sorry. You go to God first. He's your first stop. Before you tell someone I've made a mistake, you tell God. You make it right with him. But Judas never does that. He just tries to do it on his own. And he never reconciles himself to God. And it weighs so heavy upon him that he decides he can't take it. And so he, he takes his own life. There are many reasons that someone chooses to take their own life. It could be mental illness. It could be um, addiction. It could be chronic pain. It could be terminal illness. It could be trauma, uh, uh, physical abuse, social abuse, rejection. But none of those played in to what was going on with Judas. It was the fact that he would not reconcile his soul to God. And the devil says to him, take your life. And he says, okay. And yet, Jesus knew all of that. And still offered him an unshakable love. If he would offer that to Judas, my friends, he's going to offer it to us. He does offer it to us. Mary responds appropriately. Judas does not. Judas couldn't get past his own sinfulness. And my friends, we don't have to get past our own sinfulness. That was the mistake. You give it to the Lord and you receive his forgiveness. You receive his unshakable love. But here is the kicker. You receive his friendship. And when he knocks, you better be there, ready to say, yes, Lord, I want to receive you. And when you knock, this is what you can, you can be assured of. He's going to open the door. Revelation 3, uh, verse 20 says, I correct and I discipline everyone I love. So be diligent And turn from your indifference. When the Holy Spirit is nudging you, when you've made a mistake and you know that you are being corrected, know that is the Lord speaking to you. I correct and I discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. That's powerful. Friendship, salvation, forgiveness. It's ours. But we have to open the door. We have to open the door so that he can come in. And we have to accept his friendship and his gift of salvation and his love and his forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Stand with me and let's pray. Father God, we're, we're going to take this seat reminder home this week and we're going to think about what it means to open the door. To hear your voice. 
to, to share our life with you. The power of what that means to say that Jesus is my friend. Not that, not that we're taking this too casual, but you use the word friend as you speak about a relationship with us inviting you into our life. So Father God, this very day, if there's someone in this room who's yet to be a friend with you, not because you haven't offered, but because they haven't received, you've given them the ability to choose. And today, Lord, I pray they would choose you. With all eyes closed, with all heads bowed out of respect for those around you. If today is the day that you want to enter into that friendship, that saving grace friendship with Jesus, would you just gently slip your hand in the air so that I can see your hand? I see your hand. I see, hey, man, I see your hand. I see your hand. Excellent. Now, folks, look at me. Because we've had some today who've made this step, what we're going to ask of them is that as they leave this place, before they put their head on their pillow, they tell someone, I have decided to follow Jesus. And that can be a scary thing to say. So let's practice it with them. So we're all going to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Say it with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. One more time. I have decided to follow Jesus. Now you've said it twice. You can leave here and you have the courage. You tell someone, I've decided to follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.